Hello, this is Doug Gerlach from myiclub.com and iClub Central. Welcome to our Investment Club webinar. Today is March 19th, 2024. We thought this is a good time to take a look at best practices for investment clubs as they relate to club accounting and operations. So tonight we're going to run through some of our best practices that we've developed and that we share with clubs uh, who are getting started in clubs that have been long-standing that want to improve their operations become more efficient and make sure they're complying with all necessary regulations and hopefully will help their portfolios to perform most efficiently uh, tonight uh, I'll be joined in the back room by uh, Sean Russell and Treva, who are there and will be able to help answer questions as we go through. We'll be able to take a couple of breaks for questions as well. So please use that GoToWebinar application questions box to type in your questions as we go. And we'll do our best to address as many of those as we can during the presentation. There is a PDF of the slides of tonight's presentation, so you can download that from the handouts tab as well. And that will be available in the archived presentation when we upload the webinar video to our YouTube channel uh, as well. If you miss it tonight, you can always check in there and watch the webinar, grab the handout, and check out all of the other productions that we have available uh, on the iClub Central uh, channel on YouTube. So in our presentation, we're gonna be looking at the best practices for handling tasks related to investment club accounting. That's our specialty at myiclub.com, uh, but we also provide tools on the website for helping you to efficiently operate your investment club and how you can utilize my iClub for accounting and operations tasks to the fullest of its capabilities. We'll also give you some of my best practices and thoughts for managing your investment club portfolio, both for, for an eye towards uh, uh, performance as well as towards efficiency and keeping the treasurer sane and uh, doing an effective job uh, without pulling his or her, her hair out. Uh, complicated isn't better. Believe me, we've got decades of experience helping investment clubs to run and uh, developing investment club accounting platforms. So we have seen through the years all sorts of interesting ideas that people come up with to run an investing partnership. But keeping things simple brings so many benefits. There's no need to make things complicated. Wall Street is complicated enough as it is. Uh, that stems from decades of the financial industry trying to make things complicated so that people turn to professionals for assistance because they feel like they can't do it themselves. In an investment club, it behooves you to keep things focused on the job at hand, at building a portfolio, helping your members to become educated and uh, focused on the long term uh, of your portfolio and the decisions that you're making. Instead of focusing on all sorts of administrative decisions, um, you should be focusing on stock research. You should be focusing, focusing on company portfolio management uh, and uh, following up on the companies that you own in your portfolio. And in order to do that, it really helps you to keep your procedures simple, your policies reasonable. And if it's not simple, if it's not reasonable, ask yourself, why are we doing it this way? And there's always time to be making changes and improvements. So our first uh, section, we'll be talking about best practices for operating your investment club. In many cases, the operations, the accounting overlap, uh, but we tried to separate it so that you can think about how you are running your investment club and how you're starting your investment club. Now, these suggestions that you'll hear during our presentation are really meant as suggestions. If they deviate from the provisions in your club operating documents, then uh, make sure that you always abide by those operating documents. We call the operating documents uh, the, uh, the partnership agreement and or the bylaws of your investment club. And together, these are your operating documents. They 
should always be followed in every situation, especially with adding or withdrawing members, uh, with respect to the dates that you use for valuations uh, and uh, withdrawals, uh, the, these operating documents rule. So they should never be de deviated. If you feel like they should be updated, then you can certainly update them, but that requires the agreement of all your members. Uh, and that's something that is uh, quite reasonable to do on a periodic basis every few years, especially um, if you've started your club a few years ago, maybe now you've learned a few things and you can make some improvements to those documents. So you can always revise those partnership agree agreements and bylaws. Um, especially perhaps after you see this presentation, there may be things that you want to take back to your club that will uh, discuss and make decisions about improving your procedures. Now, on the partnership agreement, that has to be agreed to and signed by all of the partners. Um, and I like the the uh, uh, the the way of approaching your operating documents by having a partnership agreement which has the top level information. And then a secondary document, the bylaws, which has more specifics. So, uh, for instance, the capital, the partnership agreement will say that members shall make a regular contribution to the club, right? Very top level. The bylaws will stipulate the contribution shall be made monthly and a minimum of this amount for instance. Uh, and so uh, that way, if you need to change uh, the way that your club operates, you probably don't need to touch the partnership agreement so frequently, but you can amend the bylaws as necessary uh, in those specific details. That, that's the way that I think makes the most sense. It, it, uh, uh, many brokers require a signed copy of your partnership agreement. So uh, that happens when you have members uh, joining the partnership. But if you're making changes frequently to that partnership agreement, um, it becomes a little bit of a bureaucratic mess um, and you probably want to avoid that. Now, for many of you who are already have formed a club, uh, this it perhaps is not as relevant. If you are watching this we webinar and you're thinking about starting a club, uh, we want to advise you that we suggest the general partnership format is more appropriate than the limited liability corporation or LLC. LLCs really provide a negligible benefit over the general partnership for investment clubs, but they do create extra costs and reporting. From an IRS perspective, an LLC is treated just like a general partnership. So you can use our club tax printer, you can use my iClub, but there will be additional in most states uh, registration costs with the states and there may be annual filing costs for LLCs that don't exist for general partnerships. So be prepared for those extra expenses. And then in 2003, there were new rules that went into effect from the US Department of Treasury that requires additional reporting about the ownership of limited liability corporations. Uh, the rules aim to make financial crimes more difficult by providing information about who is in these entities. Um, and these regulations apply to LLCs, but not to general partnerships. Uh, and so LLCs must report beneficial ownership information by the end of 2024 uh, on an initial filing uh, if they formed before, before 2024. Uh, and uh, then whenever there are changes of a certain level to that, who the ownership owners are, of the LLC, uh, those have to be reported uh, to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network work, FinCEN of the Department of Treasury. So this beneficial ownership information reporting is uh, free, but it does require you to go to the website, create an account, upload uh, your information, uh, and uh, all the regulations are there if you are an LLC. Now, as of really this week, there have been um, um, uh, uh, suit brought by the U.S. Small Business Administration, uh, one of the small business organizations, national small business organizations, and uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, those business type organizations, uh, have brought suit uh, against the Treasury Department, uh, and there has been uh, a decision against the Treasury Department. Uh, with respect to these rules that create, um, you know, hardship for the small uh, small entities. So this 
there may be changes to these regulations, but it's at this point, um, uh, it, it, you know, it is a fluid situation. Uh, and so uh, it's definitely something to be aware of. If you are an LLC or thinking about an LLC, you'll want to watch out for uh, changes in this arena. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, we think that general partnerships uh, have been effective. There have been, uh, you know, negligible number of cases considering the tens or hundreds of thousands of clubs that have been formed in the U.S. over the past uh, half a century. Uh, so uh, with respect to any sort of financial uh, malfeasance. So we think that that um, uh, the partnership structure works just fine. Uh, now, another thing, if you are a partnership, uh, there are some rules that went into effect about five or six years ago. Uh, perhaps a little longer, uh, how long has it been? Uh, but the IRS uh, changed the rules around how they audit partnerships. Uh, and these new rules are uh, definitely work in the IRS's favor and they can penalize current members of clubs if there's a tax liability for liabilities that occurred well before any of the current partners were members of the investment club. So in other words, uh, say several years ago, uh, the club uh, had messed up, did something wrong, uh, and now the IRS is saying there's a, there's a penalty, there's a liability, uh, and uh, the new rules say the IRS can come to the partnership and say, you must pay us. The old rules say <clears throat> the IRS must go to the partners at the time that the liability was incurred and get the, those partners to pay up, All right? And so this could be the case that if you're a new member coming into a, an investment club that had a past discrepancy uh, and the IRS were to come back and assess a penalty that you as a current member would be liable for it. So the IRS allows partnerships to opt out because they understand that partnerships can be uh, changing uh, the number of partners, the, who the partners are, can change in a partnership that happens. So the IRS allows you to opt out of these new rules. We recommend that you do it. It's not very fair to make a current member pay, this, pay for the sins of uh, former members. Uh, so uh, one of the issues, however, with opting out is the IRS says if you have a trust as a partner in your partnership, then you can't opt out. So the bottom line is that if you allow trust in your investment club, then you can't opt out of these rules. If you can't opt out of these rules, it's uh, you have a moral obligation in our view to tell new members that if they join the club, they could be assessed in the case of uh, any past tax, tax liability um, that they might be uh, they might be held liable for by joining the partnership. Uh, and, you know, that would obviously be something that a new member would not probably want to take on. And maybe it's a minimal risk. And we're assuming that it's a minimal risk for most partnerships. But our job is not to, to assess the level of risk, but to point it out to clubs and to point out uh, the potential ramifications of their decisions. And we have seen the IRS come back and aggressively um, uh, 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 penalize investment clubs for various reasons, underreporting, non-reporting of income, uh, et cetera. So um, you need to understand this. Uh, and we uh, have done a webinar on this that you can view. There are articles in Better Investing Magazine on the uh, My iClub website where we talk about the issues around having trusts as members. Uh, there are additionally some states now where uh, there are some different regulations uh, between trusts and individuals, even though trusts are handled as individuals and share the social security numbers of the individuals in terms of a living revocable trust, which is the most common, uh, but still there are some other issues that are coming up. So understand those risks, make sure uh, that everyone understands what it means. It's our, it's our uh, stand that most members of clubs who have uh, a living revocable trust would uh, not be uh, would not suffer greatly if their club asset was not held by the trust and was held individually. Uh, that the, the the their club 
uh, the portion of their total assets that are held in the club is very small. And so uh, we don't feel like it's a, a great hardship for most people uh, to not uh, be allowed to hold their club interest in uh, their personal trust. Uh, equal ownership is something that comes up um, with alarming reg regularity where people are committed to the notion that every member of their club is equal. Uh, and uh, the problem with this is that it's impossible to maintain equal ownership over time. Um, we've got the one problem is that is the old, you can't divide 17 15 cents equally into 10 partners, right? Somebody's going to end up getting two cents and somebody's going to end up getting one cent, and now we're not equal anymore. Um, the other problem is that it's impossible over time for every member to always be current, never miss a meeting, never miss a payment. Um, we're asking an awful lot. And the minute that you start letting people pay late, they miss a meeting, they can make it up the next month, but you're gonna get the benefit of the valuation as of the last month, it's not equal. You're fudging it on, on the books, but it's not e equitable uh, any longer because someone got to keep their, their club dues for a month longer than the rest of the members. Uh, so um, we understand the, uh, the rationale on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, it's against the club's interest where you want to be creating and collecting as much capital as possible because the more capital you have, the more efficiently you can invest and the greater your returns can be over time. So by minimizing the amount that can be collected, by holding everyone to a single amount, you're doing the club a disservice. It's much better to set a minimum and let people, if they want to create, contribute more to the club, let them do it. Let the club build up the capital and invest it. Yes, their percentage ownership will be greater. Um, you can still utilize our best practice of allowing for one member, one vote by default, uh, and then allowing any member to call for a vote by capital ownership percentage uh, if they wish when you're when you're voting on something that may be uh, more serious uh, and so in that way you can accommodate um, at the simplicity of allowing everyone to have an equal vo voice uh, but not penalizing those people who don't want who who would be willing to contribute more but are prevented uh, by this uh, focus on uh, equal ownership. We don't support equal ownership. We won't, uh, if you write in and, and complain that uh, one member has two cents more than another member or two, you know, 0 0.03 units more than another member, uh, we're gonna send you the, the help document that says uh, what you're trying to do is never gonna work, so the sooner you give it up, the better. Um, so we won't, uh, we won't support it. It's important that you understand why. So uh, if this is still uh, confusing you, uh, let us know and we'll send you, uh, point you to our resources on why this is not something uh, that is sustainable. Uh, when you're considering your officers, we always suggest that you rotate your officer positions, avoiding lifetime officers whenever is possible. Um, we know there are a lot of you who are watching who are treasurers for life uh, on a de facto basis, if not on a, an elected basis or appointed basis. Uh, that's okay. Um, maybe you're fine with it. You, you've been doing it for so long that you get it, you understand it, you're efficient. <clears throat> it would co uh, cause you more pain and suffering to teach someone else how to do it when you can just simply do it yourself. We understand it. But on the other hand, it's it's uh, practical for clubs to allow members to serve in all the roles. We do. There are many clubs that have a policy that everyone will serve in every officer position. And to do that, they might have an assistant treasurer position that they will rotate into uh, so that they've always got the experienced people helping, uh, bringing the newer people on board, uh, and everyone is sharing the workload over time. We think that really is uh, an, something that you should strive for. Uh, if you have the problem with lifetime treasurers is that eventually, that treasurer is going to uh, want to retire from the club and now no one has been involved with the club accounting keeping the books 
uh, and so the club ends up folding, uh, and that would be a shame. Uh, we try to make the tools at my iClub as straightforward as possible so that anyone can handle the tasks. Our support team uh, does a great job at supporting uh, people who are just getting started. We have resources, quick start guides, user manuals, webinars, uh, so we're really trying to help as, as much as we can uh, with that issue. So we suggest that you, you work towards uh, keeping all the members engaged in all the positions over time. Education should also always be a priority. Um, investment clubs should be focused not only on uh, uh, managing a portfolio and uh, perhaps outperforming the market as an aim, but also on learning about uh, the stock market, learning about managing a portfolio, learning about other financial topics. Many clubs uh, have a vice president uh, for education or the vice president uh, assumes the role as the education officer or the club may have an education coordinator that's an appointed or an elected position that's fine as well um, and that person doesn't need to give every presentation but uh, can assign and work with uh, other members to come up with educational topics and the the great thing about this is that there's no better way to learn about a subject than having to teach it. And so if uh, you can take, anybody can come up with a 20 minute presentation that would be enlightening to the rest of the club on a particular topic. Here's what I learned about this topic for 15 or 20 minutes and uh, a couple of slides. And that's great. And that works to everyone's benefit in the club. You can bring in out, outside guests, you can, um, uh, there can be webinars uh, that you can share the replays of uh, from Better Investing and from iClub Central. So there's all sorts of topics. Uh, so we urge you to use your creativity and imagination to come up with all sort of whatever works for your particular club. So now we're going to take a look at myiclub.com and some of the best practices for using the website. There's a lot of features on there, so we understand that you might not have uh, come into contact with all of them. Uh, but uh, let's talk about some of the ways you could be using the site. Many clubs uh, shifted towards using more uh, online collaborative and communication tools during the pandemic to replace meetings or to supplement meetings um, and many clubs have kind of stuck with that policy uh, now that the pandemic has winded winded down quite a bit um, they found that it's uh, easier to get people together for a two-hour online meeting than a two-hour in-person meeting where people might travel 20 or 30 minutes each way and uh, takes up a chunk of your time uh, you can be at home at your computer in your pajamas and participate in the club meeting uh, and so my iClub also supports uh, online collaborative tools with our voting tools which allow you to create a ballot and tabulate results uh, that can be useful in between meetings or can be uh, part of an online meeting one of the advantages of the online voting tool is it creates a running record of all of the ballots that have been and uh, uh, and the results uh, as part of your club record we have an email list that you can use to communicate between members. We have a file storage where you can upload stock studies. Uh, so there are all sorts of tools that are available there to help you. Um, many clubs uh, uh, have uh, also evolved beyond meeting once in a month uh, to having two meetings a month or maybe a supplemental stock study meeting uh, that's separate from their business meeting. And that's, uh, uh, again, a way that you can expand the education. Um, and instead of having one long meeting, you can have two shorter meetings. You can have committee meetings. So uh, use the technology that's available uh, to, to, the club's, uh, to the club's good in terms of uh, uh, getting the work done on a regular basis. We've been supporting electronic and um, um, paperless accounting for a long time. Uh, now there's no need, as in the olden days, for the treasurer to print the valuation statement and member status report and bring them to the club meeting and share those copies with the members. Now uh, the 
treasurer can create the securities valuation, can email the members to say, using the link on the page that says, there's a new valuation, come get the valuation statement and the member status report and any of the reports you want prior to the meeting so that you have access to them. Uh, members uh, can view any of the data on the My iClub in the club's, uh, in the club's account. Uh, they can't change it. Only authorized officers can change it. So this really can streamline um, and make things more efficient in a, this paperless world. And we believe that it's a big advantage to be able to, for each member to learn how to go and get the valuation statement themselves. Look at the club reports themselves uh, in advance of the meeting that can make your meetings run more efficiently. Uh, if you haven't already, we highly recommend you customize your My iClub website. You can add a logo. Uh, the administrator can go to the club settings in utilities to upload a logo or choose one from our graphics library that will give you access and a little uh, spice up your website, personalize it a little bit more. Uh, so that a logo that appears on reports, it appears on all the pages of the club's website. My iClub personalizes things uh, just a little bit. If you've got a graphic artist, they can create a little image for you. Um, so that can be a fun thing to do, and we suggest that you do that. The file storage of My iClub is a great place to save your stock studies, your financial statements, your meeting minutes. Um, you can put them all there. The administrator can set in the people section the profiles of who can upload, organize, delete files and folders. Uh, so you can set it so that all members can upload files, but only the administrator or certain people can delete files <clears throat> or move. <coughs> excuse me, or move files. Um, so you have the you can. Uh, set all of that in the people section. The file storage also includes our free resources library that has our quick start guides, our user guides, other user information that can help you uh, as you're learning to use the site and running your investment club. Backing up is such an important topic. We've done a webinar uh, uh, on this one topic alone, best practices for backing up your club data. In my iClub, we have a backup manager. You should be familiar with it as treasurer administrator of your club. We do automatically make backups if you don't make them. So after a certain period of time, we will back up your data for you. We have on the, the back end, we have redundant backups of the server and all of our websites, um, but those are to protect if there's a catastrophic hardware or software failure. So if uh, some of the equipment goes down, there's always a backup that can be restored to bring it back up. What the what those ser back server level backups don't do is protect you from making a mistake in your club um, that becomes uh, unrecoverable. Um, so the example I like to provide is that you're doing something complicated for the first time, maybe it's a withdrawal, maybe you're trying to correct transactions that happened a year ago um, uh, that was entered wrong and you're trying to fix it now. And uh, often these uh, lead you down a rabbit hole where you make a change, um, it didn't, something went wrong, You misentered the information so you try to delete the transaction and re-enter it and before you know it you're in a different transaction and you realize you just deleted the wrong transaction and so now you try to recover it and you know this should this uh should not sound implausible it happens all the time uh, but uh, if you go to the backup manager before you start mucking around with historical data and, and fixing old errors uh, and you make a backup right away. If you're in this case and uh, you make a mistake, uh, all you have to do is go to the backup manager and restore the backup that you made before you started and you're back to exactly where you were. So it's very important. Um, we've had cases where um, someone who was a former treasurer but didn't have their permissions revoked uh, went in and thought they were, by deleting, just thought that they were removing it from their view and didn't realize they were actually deleting data. <clears throat> the club hadn't done a backup 
in several weeks. And so now all of this data um, for the last four or five weeks had to be entered, um, re-entered, figure out what, what hadn't been entered and uh, uh, figure out uh, what needed to be entered, re-enter it and bring restore the books. That's a lot, a lot of extra work. Uh, whereas if the treasurer had made a, a more current backup, they could have simply restored the backup. So the backup manager is your friend. It's something that you should be familiar with and understand it. We also recommend that you have a regular routine to store those backup files, not only on our server, but also offline. Uh, so that you have, again, the purpose of a backup is to protect you from catastrophic loss. Um, so um, that could be, you know, again, you didn't delete, remove uh, a, a former treasurer's position and they hit, you know, the grandkids were playing on the computer while they were logged in, hit the button that's, and deleted the club's website, right? Those things happen and those are not things that we can uh, restore for you. So if you have a backup, we can you can we can walk you through getting everything restored uh, so we suggest that you download that backup file periodically it doesn't have to be every month you know every six months you know uh, if you've got a club of 10 or 12 or 15 people that's probably fine if you've got a club of 20 or 30 members um, where everyone is making contributions every month, you don't want to be entering six months worth of transactions. Uh, so you want to have more frequent backups. Uh, so save that backup file to your computer, put one on a flash drive, put it in a, in a safety deposit box once a year, you know, protect and save that data. In the file storage area, we've got a file takeout feature that's really unique. Nobody else has that where you can download all the files from your file storage in one zip file. So again, you've got all the information uh, that if you needed to, you could access it, you could get it, uh, get it there. Um, don't, uh, and when you're doing backups, you know, putting it, uh, uh, whenever you're doing a backup, uh, you know, we, we suggest having it off site. So there's, it's no good to have all of your backup files on a flash drive in your desk drawer right below your personal computer. If you've got a flood or a fire, the desk, the computer, and the flash drive are all going to go, right? So you need to have it in a re remote place. Uh, Russell uh, emails it to himself in his Gmail account, right? Just email that file to yourself. It sits in a folder, um, in an archive folder. If he needs it, he can always go to Gmail and he's got the folder there. So you can do that. Uh, the, the backup files are not that big. Uh, so that's a, a great way of saving that file. So think through this carefully. Don't rely solely on uh, on um, the the, uh, the fact that it's online to mean that all of your backup needs are taken care of. The people permissions page that I've talked about is something that the administrator should review. Um, if you haven't done it in a while, look at each member, make sure that they've uh, got the appropriate permissions. We've added permissions, so the default permissions may not be set for every member, uh, but you can see they're categorized roughly in areas that correspond to the officer roles that have often been uh, uh, off the tasks that officers have often been charged with uh, in the past so that you know the secretary would have the roles to manage people um, uh, and uh, uh, folders in the library the treasurer of course manages the accounting information um, there's some new things because it's uh, this is an online site you, you're obviously your um, um, uh, your stock watcher and message board positions uh, are something that maybe you don't have to worry about in it in a in a in the days before using my iClub uh, but do review this information um, the help page will give you more details on each of these if you have questions don't whatever you do give all members treasurer duties and one little tip here is when you go to the people page there are tabs for the treasurer and for the administrator. Check to see who your treasurers are. We've seen clubs that have five people with treasurer permissions, and that's probably three people too many. Um, the administrator has all Uber privileges across the site, including accounting, uh, but the administrator may not be the treasurer. Um, so when you change 
officer roles, make sure that you update the permissions here. Let's talk now about best practices for investment club accounting. Um, some of these are, uh, are uh, we frequently run into clubs that violate these practices and uh, uh, they have all sorts of uh, problems that result from it. Uh, the first rule is create no more than one valuation per month. Don't create temporary or unofficial securities valuations. Um, we hear of clubs who want to do this so they can reconcile their brokerage statement. It's really unnecessary. Uh, and the problem is that if you create a temporary valuation and you don't delete it and you enter transactions, they're going to use that valuation, which would violate your partnership agreement, perhaps. So uh, not a good practice. Don't create a valuation for a member withdrawal. Again, your bylaws probably state how that withdrawal is valued. Um, there's no need to create a separate valuation. Use the, the club's regular monthly securities valuation. The only other non-monthly valuation you should have is the year-end valuation on December 31st. Uh, and so that is uh, to close out the year and to comply with IRS regulations. Your club's partnership agreement operating documents will define in most cases, how and when the club's portfolio is valued. So we suggest that it's close to the meeting date as possible um, these days. Uh, you know, again, it was different before the internet was widespread. You might need to use a newspaper to get uh, the current prices uh for for stocks and so um, it wasn't something that you could do the day of the meeting or the day before the meeting uh, so today however it's different we have closing prices every day they come in late at night overnight um, so uh on a tuesday uh, at uh, by nine in the morning you should be able to get the prior day's closing prices create that valuation that would be used at your Tuesday night meeting. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, as good as it gets. The, the advantage of having current prices on your valuation is it gives the members information that they need during the meeting to evaluate the fundamental performance of the portfolio, how companies are doing, are they up, are they down. If you're looking at a valuation statement from two weeks ago, now you've got to go look at current prices to understand because maybe things have changed and uh, prices of securities tend to change quite a bit in short periods of time. So you could be making decisions based on stale information. So we, we really think that the, uh, you should make sure that your policies align the valuation statement with the meeting schedule. Now, one reason that that clubs don't do this is because they want to reconcile their brokerage state statement to the valuation statement. And it's not really necessary because you should be able to use the reconciliation wizard to check the books against the brokerage. And uh, if you um, insist on using the securities valuation that the club does uh, and do it on the same date as your brokerage issues your monthly statement, uh, the best thing that we can suggest to you is to switch the club meeting date so that it meets early in the month. So that the valuation date uh, as of the end of the month uh, is going to provide you with valid information. Uh, make sure every month to reconcile your books. The biggest problems that we see with clubs perhaps is that uh, they uh, we get calls all the time. Treva was talking today. Someone called. They said uh, they tried to sell stocks and uh, a stock from their club, and the 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 order they placed was for more shares than they had in the in the club's records. And we pointed out that that means if your broker had 100 shares and you only had 80 shares in the books, that means somewhere along the line you didn't enter a buy transaction or there's an error. Uh, and uh, that maybe that's an easy thing to find, uh, but we also hear of cl clubs that haven't reconciled their books since 2021 and now wonder why everything is off so much. The balance, the cash balances are wrong, the number of shares are wrong. If you reconcile the books every month, you're not going to run into those problems. 
And it's not to say that, be, and this is just the nature of unit value accounting, that tiny errors are going to compound over time. Um, and so, and they become increasingly difficult and frustratingly hard to find and fix. If you match it up every month, then you're going to be in fine shape. You're going to find the typos. You're going to find the errors. You're going to find the problem that the broker made. You know, the brokers uh, often are the source of errors. Uh, so I would urge you before you start to call our support line and say that um, your records are wrong and uh, that you confirm that the broker uh, record is correct. Uh, if you are insistent again on matching and reconciling properly to your brokerage account, um, the thing to keep in mind is the portfolio value on the brokerage account is not at all important to match to the My iClub uh, portfolio value. The important things to match are the number of shares and the, the amount of cash. Right, if those things match as of a particular date, then your books are in balance. Um, the broker end of month prices may be different than the My iClub end of month prices. Um, and certainly the valuation statement prices may be different as well. Stock prices change every second of every day the market is open. Uh, and uh, the, the rules around what is a closing price for any security on any exchange in any market um, is going to be different from data provider to data provider. So it may be well the case that uh, your broker uses a different closing price than our price provider uses. Both of them are, quote, correct, uh, but it's just a, a discrepancy there. But what should always match is the number of shares and the amount of cash that you have. This is somewhat controversial, but but I am uh, opposed to dividend reinvestment in investment clubs. Now, dividend reinvestment is nothing more than a linked pair of transactions, two transactions, receipt of a dividend, uh, which is income, and buy a purchase of shares, right? We're taking the dividend, we're reinvesting it. The dividend is still taxable, um, and there is a purchase, which is its own tax lot that's created from the reinvestment. But because of the IRS rules that have been in effect for most of the last 10, 15 years about brokers reporting capital gains, uh, every tax lot has to be reconciled when you make a sell uh, so that the amount of gains and losses uh, can be reported correctly to the IRS. Now, if you're reinvesting dividends four times a year for 15 years, you've got 60 tax lots plus any additional lots, the initial one, when you bought the shares, any add-on uh, uh, transactions, so looking at 60 to 70 different tax lots. Now, when you sell the shares, some of those uh, most recent reinvestments are going to be short-term capital gains or losses, so they're going to be counted separately, uh, and your broker is helpfully going to lump everything together and say, here are all the lots uh, with a, uh, in a single transaction with acquisition date various, and here's the cost basis uh, for those lots in total. Whereas we're going to make you reconcile every single tax lot. Now, in the tax printer, we allow you to group them together, but you're still going to have to do uh, the calculations to make it all match up. So uh, ask a treasurer who's had a many portfolio of many securities with dividend reinvestment over the course of many years what it's like to prepare taxes after those shares have been sold, and it's not fun. Uh, and um, sometimes it's impossible to get it to balance if the shares were purchased prior to the IRS rules going into effect about the reporting of capital gains and losses by brokers. So that just further complicates things. And then the other problem we frequently see is that clubs forget to disable dividend reinvestment after they sell the shares. So they sell the shares at a loss, and now the next dividend comes in that they're still able to receive. They receive the dividend, it's uh, purchased the shares, which now creates a wash sale. So now part of that capital loss is disallowed. So, uh, uh, and that, again, further complicates tax preparation. 
Better investing has one of its four principles that investors should reinvest all earnings. That is not the same thing as reinvest dividends in the stocks that paid those dividends. Uh, the better investing's principle is simply to say, don't spend your profits from your investment activities, put those profits back to work in your portfolio. So receiving dividends, putting them into cash in your portfolio and using them for your next best uh, purchase in your club fully satisfies the better investing rationale. Uh, the dividend reinvestment creates additional transactions that have to be reconciled, that have to be balanced, creates the additional complications at tax time. Uh, it uh, uh, confuses people when they're looking at the complete journal ledger uh, because they're seeing the money coming in and going out. Uh, so if you simply report it, record it as a dividend uh, and use that dividend later to purchase additional shares and something else uh, that works to the benefit of the club and keeps the treasurer sane. When you're entering buy or sell transactions, you never have to enter the cost per share, right? Cost per share is a calculated value. We may show it to as many as six decimal places. Um, your broker may show it to four decimal places. Um, there can be rounding involved. The important thing is the number of shares exactly and the total amount of the purchase or sale exactly. Cost per share is not relevant at all. It may not match, and that is fine because it's just a derived value. Uh, make sure that after, if, you, if you've done the job and the cost and the number of shares matches the total cost and the number of shares, then you've done the, the, hard, the heavy lifting. <clears throat> uh, now, another uh, problem that we run into is when clubs try to use member fees to cover club expenses. You're gonna have expenses as an investment club you're gonna be paying for your My iClub subscription, your tax preparation, uh, you're gonna be paying for better investing memberships, research tools that you need, uh, postage, uh, uh, printing copies, et cetera. It comes with the territory, but trying to levy additional sums and collect for from members for those expenses, um, from the member's perspective, it's all just cash going out, whether they're paying for expenses or they're paying to invest, right? It's money out of your pocket. And so trying to uh, collect money to cover expenses as fees and not giving them and not giving members units for those uh, those fees, uh, that money that they give in, you don't get units for. It's it's an arbitrary, uh, it's an arbitrary uh, uh, practice and it's unnecessary. It's really unnecessary. So uh, fees should only be used in penalty situations such as an, uh, a bounce check, right? That's the only time you should be using fees. Um, and the big problem comes if you try to collect fees to cover equally allocated expenses. So instead of using expenses, uh, recording expenses by capital account percentage, you're recording them by per person basis. Um, if you collect fees against those expenses, you're gonna penalize members with lower levels of investment in the club. They're gonna end up pay losing more units <clears throat> because of that practice. We can go through the math and show you why that's, that works. Um, but yeah, if you're, uh, if you're cynical in your club uh, and you, you're a member with a uh, uh, high level of ownership relative to, to other members, um, then you know it's in your interest to encourage this practice, but it's not fair. It's not equitable at all. And so if you simply don't collect member fees to cover expenses. You can ask people to make an additional capital contribution in a particular month um, and let them buy the units. It's just much cleaner and it works to everyone's benefit. As you start thinking through it, this whole thing of, of setting uh, aside, uh, you know, um, it's like asking people um, who are giving you a $20 bill every month to next month, give us uh, two $10 bills because somehow that makes a difference. Uh, in the recording of the expense, it's all just $20. Don't charge late fees at all, right? We're trying to keep the treasurer sane. We don't want the treasurer to be a bill collector. We want the treasurer to do the job that they've been elected to do. Collecting late fees 
only makes things more difficult. If somebody wants to be late to the party, let them be late to the party, right? They're not, they're gonna be hurting themselves over time. If your club is doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is seeing its unit value increase over time, members who are habitually late are gonna miss out on buying their units at the lower value. They're gonna get the higher value of the next month. Over time, it's gonna to work to their detriment. So there's no need to penalize them anymore. And if you uh, institute a no late fee policy, if you let people contribute when they wanna contribute, how they wanna contribute, you can still set your minimum monthly contribution and allow them to contribute more um, <clears throat> and uh, welcome the people who are paying on time uh, and remind the people who are paying late that they're only hurting themselves. And, you know, and that may, they may not care, but uh, it certainly keeps the treasurer um, a little uh, more focused on the accounting uh, instead of uh, the, you know, checking off who paid, who didn't pay, who has to be collected, how do we get this money, do they send it to you, do they have to drop off a check, you know, that's just a lot of additional extra work that you don't have to worry about. The IRS says that you, your expenses should be allocated by percentage ownership unless your partnership agreement specifies otherwise. Right? And so this, we run into this with um, uh, better investing member dues, right? Where every member, um, uh, every member, every club is charged a fee per member. And so um, the club thinks, all right, so we're gonna allocate this expense by percentage ownership because each member um, is paying $75 or whatever the, whatever the current membership rate is. Um, the IRS says that you can't do that. And the way to think about it from the club's perspective is that if this is a club expense, then it benefits everybody in the club, right? And so a club expense where you're paying per member um, benefits the entire club. It benefits your club to have everyone have access to the tools, to have access to the learning, to have access to the SSG Plus so that they can uh, they can <clears throat> fulfill their duties to the club as a stock watcher uh, and uh, add SSGs to the watch list, right? So uh, in that nature, the newer members are gonna end up paying less because their ownership is only, you know, 2% of the club and a longstanding member is, uh, who owns 15%, it's gonna cover 15% of the total club uh, member dues that are paid to better investing. And so, yes, you put more money in, you own more, you're going to pay more in expenses. So if this bothers you, first of all, think about it from the perspective, what if we did this with profits? We shared the profits on an equal basis so that every person got the exact same amount of the profits of the club, whether they own 2% or 15%. And right away, everyone's saying, no, 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 that's not very fair. So what's the difference here? Well, the IRS says the difference is that we're gonna, you're not gonna charge one member more than another member for expensive. If, and so if this rationale uh, just doesn't fly, then we say keep that expense off the books altogether. Just have every member write a check to Better Investing and the club treasurer sends them all in uh, in one envelope and they process them at the office, the home office in Troy, Michigan and everything is taken care of and we've uh, eliminated this problem uh, once and for all. But so think about this, talk about this, understand why this uh, practice is suggested this way. We're not just making things up, but this is uh, the uh, the rationale uh, as to why we believe that allocated expenses should always be processed on a percentage ownership basis. Don't prevent your members from withdrawing uh, unreasonably. Uh, withdrawal fees are out of vogue, out of fashion. A lot of clubs start out saying, if you leave, we're gonna take 5%, right, or 3% whatever it is, 3% um, uh, uh, or the uh, actual cost, whichever is higher. 
Um, today, the cost of withdrawals tend to be very low, in most because of the commission fee brokers. So, um, um, uh, but fees still tend to be lingering around. It's um, you know it's it's not really very fair to members to lock up their money. So we believe just get rid of the withdrawal fees. Let's not, not even make this part of the equation. Don't force people to keep money in the club, especially if they need it. You're going to penalize them for needing to take a withdrawal. Uh, it's their money. Don't prevent them from accessing it. Um, yeah, we don't want members to be uh, using the club like an ATM, cashing out, you know, making things more difficult. That's that's fine. You can add an understanding to the club agreement that says, you know, we 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 expect members to keep their assets in the club and not make more than one withdrawal a year or something like that. Uh, just to keep people in mind that the money needs to be at work in the club portfolio for the club portfolio to succeed. And I think everyone gets that message, but life has a way of getting in the way of uh, those those best intentions. So let's not overly prevent people from getting out. And, and likewise, let's not lock them in and say, once you join, you can't leave for five years. Uh, I've seen those provisions as well. No, nope, doesn't work. You've got a, a disgruntled member, an unhappy member. You're going to keep them unhappy for four or five years in the club. So we don't think that that's very reasonable. Um, use the member withdrawal scenario calculator. It's amazing to me how many questions we get about withdrawals uh, where people just ignore this tool. They don't know about it. They don't use it. They haven't seen it. Um, this will help you on a decide the best way to process a member withdrawal, cash, stock, combination, um, which stocks, uh, sell at a loss, sell at a gain, is it a full, is it a partial, processes all of the, the inputs and gives you something that you can take to a club meeting and talk about the, the options for how are we going to handle this member withdrawal uh, and then uh, make, the, uh, make, the de make the decision about which is the best way. It's in the, um, the member withdrawal screen, it's on the people page, that you can find it in lots of ways. Uh, Give it a try uh, and get comfortable with using it. Uh, you can go through and you know say, well, what if I'm going to withdraw? Uh, I need five thousand uh, dollars as a partial withdrawal, uh, and just see what the options are. So you can understand the rationale why, in certain cases, it's good to sell the stock, or it's good to transfer the stock, or it's good to sell a stock at a loss instead of selling one that it's at a gain. So the calculator is uh, really useful in that way. Um, we also hear from a lot of clubs who go through a lot of angst when member withdraw and they, they need to raise cash. They don't want to sell any of their stocks. And so everyone, they're trying to collect from additional contributions for all the members. Um, most of those clubs have a stock that probably should be sold from the portfolio. If you follow Better Investing's rule of five, uh, which says that for every five stocks that you purchase using the stock selection guide, three of them will perform as expected, one will perform better than expected, and one will underperform. So if you've got a portfolio of 15 or 20 stocks, chances are you've got three to four stocks that are not really performing up to your expectations. Those are the prime candidates to be sold uh, when you need to raise cash for a withdrawal. You'll generate a capital loss, which will can be used by all the members at tax time or will offset future or already um, uh, realized gains in the club portfolio, and it'll clean up the portfolio. And if you're selling those shares at a capital loss, you should consider the sale to be temporary. And in 30 plus days to avoid a wash sale situation, you can review the stock to repurchase it. Uh, and in 90% of the cases when clubs and investors make a temporary sale like this, they never go back to the stock. They say, nope, nope, you know what? We've got better things to do with our cash than go back to this dog that did not serve our needs at all. That was a big disappointment that caused a lot of friction in the club. Everybody hated the stock. We just never didn't, didn't want to sell it because we didn't want to hurt the, the feelings of the member who suggested it. But if you're selling it to raise cash, that's a valid reason and it's a good portfolio strategy uh, in those cases. Um, as part of your electronic 
paperless strategy. Sign, make sure that you're getting electronic bank and brokerage account statements and confirmations and, and uh, tax reporting from your broker. Um, and it's a good practice to store those as PDFs in the club's file storage area. Uh, your club is transparent. All members should be able to access and see that information in the ports, um, so it's good to keep them in the, the file storage area. Many clubs are moving to a more electronic payment system, uh, so if your broker allows, you can have members send funds electronically to the club's account at the broker via ACH or online bill pay. Uh, your bank or broker can give you information on how this can be uh, done. Uh, it's always possible there can be some special uh, uh, payee language that you use um, uh, for those types of transfers or payments. And then uh, because the treasurer will only see the amount coming in and won't see the source of those funds, uh, one, the tool that you can use, the trick that you can use, is to assign each member a different number of cents that they append to their uh, contributions. So instead of $20, uh, the first member uh, always uh, appends point, uh, one cent. So $20 and one cent, and you know this is partner John. Uh, the next partner, uh, it gets two cents. So $20 and two cents, this is Linda. And $20 and three cents, that's Bob. And you go through that until you reach all of your, your um, everyone's got um, a different uh, uh, amount, number of cents. And uh, so now the treasurer always knows, they can refer to that chart and know which member made which contribution. This works up to 99 members. It works actually up to 100 members. Yes, uh, it, it can uh, introduce differences, slight differences in the uh, the number of units that are purchased each month. But uh, again, we're talking about pennies over the course of a long period of time. It's not going to be significant at all and uh, can make up for it for the uh, benefits of the treasurer not having to collect checks, uh, endorse them, and then deliver them to a bank or broker. One of the things that's come up is a lot of clubs have uh, questions about how to handle money market dividends. Um, uh, I don't know if this is a, a, a problem that's re uh, reoccurring now that money markets are paying more si substantial dividends, uh, but money market dividends are treated as interest by the IRS. So uh, when you receive a dividend from a money market in your brokerage account, it's no different from receiving interest from a bank account uh, from a tax perspective. So in my iClub, you have the option of creating a security that would be called a money market security. Uh, and then your the, the dividends that they're paid get entered as a security dividend in the books. Um, the problem with this, this method is that now this money market security shows on your securities uh, in the security section of your valuation statement, not in the cash section. Um, it also means that when you want to make a purchase, you've got to sell shares of the money market, uh, then collect the cash, and then use the cash to purchase the uh, the, the uh, securities that you're buying. The broker does all this automatically. You don't have to sell a money market. They'll automatically do it for you, but you have to record that sell uh, of the money market in your club's books in order for the everything to match up simply so much easier to just say instead of a money market it's cash we're just going to handle the money market like cash uh, and that way it'll show up in the cash section of the valuation statement instead of recording a money market dividend you just record interest uh, from the broker uh, and, uh, and and uh, then everything will be straightforward at tax time now uh, one note here that i'll add is that we don't recommend that there's any need uh, for a typical investment club to be using federally tax-free money markets. Uh, again, we get the need for it. Some, some, if you have large sums of cash in your personal account, you may wish to have a federally tax-free money market. Um, we don't see that there's a big benefit 
in a an investment club where your cash is simply waiting to be invested in the next opportunity. You're not parking a lot of assets in cash. Um, and so this does create some problems. If you do that, you've got to ha manage it as a security. Um, uh, and uh, in the security profile, you've got to mark it as federal tax free. But um, but we suggest staying away from those federal uh, tax-free money markets uh, altogether. Uh, and they cause problems, especially with New York State. Uh, they, um, uh, the New York State tax, uh, partnership tax returns does require some additional handling for federal tax-free money markets. Don't enter transactions on December 31st. Keep that date clear for the year annual allocation of income and expenses to members. Move any of your December 31st transactions to 1230 uh, and add a note about the actual dividend date. If you've got uh, dividend uh, mutual funds uh, or other securities that pay a dividend in January, but it's taxable in the prior tax year, again, enter that on December 30th. This is how they get picked up in the tax printer. Um, to make sure that your taxes are correct. One of the other year-end tasks is that you should be in uh, holding an audit committee, convening an audit committee that, of your club members who will review the books. We have an audit uh, handbook that you can uh, download that will give you uh, steps and what to do and how to run. Uh, again, it's just great to have another set of eyes or several sets of eyes looking at the transactions for the year, trying to catch typos, learning about the process of recording uh, and keeping the club's books, and um, uh, but most especially uh, identifying problems before they become much bigger uh, down the road. Uh, hopefully you've all met the March 15th IRS deadline for partnerships. Um, if you miss your deadlines, uh, miss that deadline, penalties are uh, uh, pile up fast. They're on a per month, per member basis. So uh, uh, don't, <laughs> don't. Make sure that you understand that partnership returns are due March 15th with other business returns, not April 15th when personal returns are due. E-filing uh, has been great. Uh, thousands of clubs are using e-filing at MyiClub each year. Um, it's been very successful. Uh, the number of uh, problems is uh, that clubs have is minimal. It's usually resulting from sort of data entry and uh, un, uh, un characters that are disallowed. Um, and we hop on those and get those resolved with you as well. Know that states are more and more requiring e-filing, more and more requiring partnerships to file and are cracking down on it. And there are eight states that require uh, any partnership that has a partner in their state what, regardless of where the partnership is officially located, must file a state return. So some clubs might be filing two, three, four state returns if they're an online club with members in different states. Always uh, keep in mind that uh, it's a good idea to have a backup treasurer, a co-treasurer, an assistant treasurer, someone who can who can um, uh, take over the t some of the tasks or help the treasurer. Uh, there are some clubs that have, that split the treasurer duties. One is responsible for uh, dealing with member transactions. One is responsible for dealing with security transactions, for instance. Uh, you can do whatever makes sense to you, but the advantage of that is that you've got two people who have the skills and the knowledge and the experience that can take over if one of them suddenly needs to go into the hospital or is taking a, a six-month cruise and won't be available. You've got someone who can step into that role. If you've got an assistant treasurer, that works as well. With my iClub, you can have uh, a backup treasurer, or co-treasurer, assistant treasurer, and give them permission and work through it so that it's easy to switch when you need to. We're going to uh, wrap up with some best practices for portfolio management in your clubs. Um, it's my belief that uh, investment clubs should only invest in common stocks, that you should stay away from ETFs, you should stay away from mutual funds. Um, the reasons are that it's very difficult to manage the diversification of a stock portfolio if you're holding a security that owns hundreds or thousands of additional stocks. So now all of a sudden, uh, you can't tr easily measure the true diversification of your portfolio uh, because, and your portfolio is going to perform 
more in line with that index or ETF. Uh, it's impossible also for members to effectively integrate the portfolio of the club into their personal portfolio because the club portfolio is really just like an index fund. So, uh, and, uh, uh, it's, or maybe it's holding other types of assets. Uh, and so it makes it very difficult. If your club is managed like a stock fund, well, that's, that makes it very easy for a member to say, okay, this is my, part of my growth stock assets. I want to have some more dividend centric assets. So that's what I'm going to go, uh, in my personal portfolio, lean towards those types of companies. But if your club is investing in high yield stocks and um, uh, ETFs and uh, limited partnerships and income opportunities and you know all sorts of arcane securities, uh, it, it's impossible for an individual to uh, align that portfolio with their personal holdings. So use the club's educational focus to look at small company stocks, to look at financials or insurance companies that you might think are too complicated uh, and use those to look at those types of companies in your portfolio. Many of those non-stock securities uh, create problems for securities or for treasurers. We suggest that uh, clubs avoid gold precious metals and commodities and ETFs that hold them, hold them directly. Um, their tax rules are different for those types of ETFs and those types of assets than they are for stocks. Real estate investment trusts, business development companies, uh, these, uh, their distributions tend not to be um, uh, dividends or uh, maybe dividends are a small portion or a portion of their distribution. And so the tax treatment uh, is different and we don't, you won't know that until January and you'll have to go back and edit the distributions that are made by those entities. Royalty trusts, publicly limited traded partnerships, master limited partnerships, um, these all have uh, similar problems with the classification and reclassification of dividends and distributions um, into returns of capital and other types of income that you have to adjust those transactions uh, if you're investing in a partnership they don't have to give your club a k1 until march 15th when you're supposed to be done and filing your club's uh, partnership uh, tax return with the irs so you might have to uh, get uh, an extension if you own those types of securities. Cryptocurrency um, or ETFs that hold them, uh, cryptocurrency is taxed differently, again, than stocks. And we don't support it in the tax printer. Uh, there are some new ETFs that hold cryptocurrency, and there's a question about the tax status of those, uh, but for now, we're saying stay away from them. We also don't support options, so we, we suggest that you stay away from options. Stick to common stocks. That gives you plenty of opportunity to, uh, to invest in in all types of industries, all types of sectors, all types of company sizes, and build an effective and efficient portfolio. Also new uh, in the last couple of years is IRS reporting of foreign income and requirements around it. So understand the issues with foreign companies before you're buying them. Um, the uh, uh, amounts and countries of origin of foreign income must be reported uh, on your 1065. And um, if they exceed certain amounts, or if you're unable to opt out of the reporting requirements, then your Schedule K-2, which is sent to the IRS, and Schedule K-3, which is prepared and distributed to each partner, party, uh, partner uh, are each 20 pages. Uh, we've heard of clubs with 1,000 page IRS returns uh, if they print them all out. So if you've got a lot of foreign source income, uh, the amount is significant um, of how much withholding there is. So understand those before you are holding foreign companies or ADRs, and some clubs may wish to avoid non-US companies due to those difficulties. You can still diversify internationally by holding companies that operate outside uh, uh, have operations outside the U.S. as well as inside the U the uh, United States. Um, link your club stocks to members' SSGs. 
Uh, we introduced this a few years ago. Uh, your members who are better investing members can link their stock selection guides done in SSG Plus to stocks they've been assigned in my iClub. There's a guide in the free resources section of file storage that can give you uh, directions on how to do it. Uh, it becomes, um, uh, it gets easier. It, it's not always the easiest thing to set up. And if you're not doing it every month, then you're you're going to forget to do it, how to do it from month to month. But once you do, uh, prior to the club meeting, you come to the SSG tool, you update your club uh, assigned stocks there, and uh, they show up in my iClub on the portfolio reports. When it works, it works great. Uh, and it really helped keep everybody up to date about the uh, the club portfolio. You should also have a club stock watcher routine. Uh, use the stock watcher system. Our stock watcher report is a suggestion, really, uh, a baseline for the kinds of things you should be looking for. Uh, too often, club members report on a stock by talking about how much the price has gone up since the stock was purchased, which everyone sees on the valuation statement. Anyway, that's not news. What you want to know is how well is the company performing fundamentally? What did the last quarter look like? What is the company's guidance for the future? Is it on track to meet your objectives? Members should report on your follow stocks at least four times a year after earnings have been reported. That's a good baseline. That's a good target. Uh, and uh, the focus should be on the fundamentals, not on price changes. Clubs should diversify their portfolio. Um, you can see our archived webinars on club portfolio management and portfolio reviews. Good target is 25% small, 50% mid-sized companies, and 25% large companies, at least seven sectors uh, in your portfolio, and each stock in a different industry. If you've got overlapping industries, overlapping companies in the same industry, uh, you're losing benefits of diversification. Don't overweight with large cap. Too many clubs focus on brand name consumer facing companies. They're big large, large caps, they're popular companies, uh, but the problem is they can tend to deliver lower returns over time. Uh, small and mid-sized companies can be more volatile, but they'll boost your returns over time. And it might take a little more work. You might have more a higher failure rate in some ways uh, by looking at those smaller companies. But um, uh, if you venture outside your comfort zone, you can reap the benefits there. Don't hold tiny stock positions. Any stock less than 3% of your portfolio uh, is not helping returns. You've got a stock, it's 1% of your portfolio. If it doubles overnight, you have a 1% gain. 100% gain in the security price, and it, the benefit to the portfolio was 1%. If it was a 15% holding and it doubled overnight, now we're talking about real money. Uh, so those small positions should either be divested or added to. And yes, if you're building up a position over time, if you have a plan to add to positions over time, then you can hold on to them. But otherwise, it's sometimes it's better to buy more shares of a stock you already own and you're familiar with, even if it's a little pricey, than hold on to lots of shards, uh, these tiny positions in your portfolio. Don't load too many stocks, though. Uh, research shows that a portfolio of 20 to 30 stocks gives you optimal risk and reward. If you own more, the more stocks you own past 30 or so companies, um, you don't uh, reduce the risk in your portfolio, but you do decrease the returns, right? There's a sweet spot that you want to reduce risk, but still be able to generate maximum returns past 30 stocks, your portfolio starts to, starts to operate like an, in, uh, an index fund. And you want to be concentrated in 20 or 30 well-managed, uh, high-quality companies that you bought at reasonable prices uh, and allow your company, those companies to grow over time. Keep your costs low in your portfolio, in your club. Every dollar you spend reduces returns. Simple as that. Investment expenses are not no longer deductible at all for individuals, and even when they were deductible, few individuals got any tax benefits. So keep your costs as reasonable as possible, um, and uh, keep in mind that there's no such thing as deductible investment expenses. 
In my iClub, we have a benchmark and performance report. Um, you can use that report to compare your club to a broad market index or any security or index fund that you can find or ETF. Uh, don't obsess over the compound annual return on the valuation statement or that benchmark report, especially if you're in your first few years of operations. Um, can take three or four years before clubs start to see the benefit of stock selection and uh, picking uh, good companies in their portfolios and allowing those companies the time to grow. Uh, and so don't expect results out of the gate. Um, once or twice a year, you can check in it on your benchmark and performance report. At the end of the year is a good time. Take take stock of the year. How did we do this year? How are we doing over the long term? Uh, but uh, understand that small changes in uh, big changes in small periods of time tend to skew an annualized rate of return. So um, understand uh, understanding that is key to interpreting your club's performance reports. So let's talk about some final thoughts. Uh, putting these practices to work. Uh, if you're a long-standing club, you may ha have different policies in place, but I think there's always room for improvement. Uh, so consider some of these ideas that make sense to you and that you can uh, deploy in your club. But there's also no need to reinvent the wheel. The best practices exist because this is the accumulated knowledge of decades and decades of management of clubs and uh, developing club accounting and talking with clubs and meeting with clubs uh, over time. There are really good reasons why these best practices uh, are have been developed and the problems we see come from clubs that try to get fancy. They come up with a new way of doing things. They, they think they're the first ones. They've got this new idea uh, and uh, they, they start running with it. And before you know it, they're, uh, they're tripping over their feet and they reach out to us and say, you know, why is this, uh, why, why can't we do it this way? And um, uh, when we explain it to them, now they've got to, you know, reconsider how their, uh, their club has been set up and make the necessary adjustments. If they'd followed the principles that we've aligned, uh, that we've outlined uh, tonight, they would be in much better position. Um, keeping things simple, keeping things straightforward, don't trying to make uh, extraneous rules and complications uh, will serve you over the long term. For more on club operations, I mentioned our iClub Trend Central channel on YouTube where you can find webinar replays on topics like disaster preparedness, IRS audit rules, tax preparation, training new treasurers, backup procedures, and more. So there's a lot of resources that we have available there. You can also find more in our help center at myiclub.com. Well, thank you for turning out tonight. Um, uh, Sean and Russell Treva have been busy in the back office helping people uh, with the questions that you've had. And I know we've gone over a little bit tonight, a lot to cover, uh, but thanks for attending. Thanks for using my iClub. And we'll look forward to seeing you at our next uh, next webinar in April, April where, where we'll be talking about our new online uh, club discussion forum uh, that my iClub members and Better Investing members will have access to. So you can see us then uh, at the third, third Tuesday of April. We'll see you all then. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you next month.